Um, so yeah, so this is joint work with uh, Chuan Chen and Roberto Hernandez Palomares. Uh, and as Dave mentioned in his talk, Chuan, who is Dave's PhD student, is actually on the job market this year. So if you have a postdoc position available and you are interested in the things that I talk about today, reach out to Chuan. I'm sure he would be happy to hear from you. Okay, so I want to start by talking about uh, quantum symmetry. So quantum symmetries is kind of an umbrella term that means a lot of different things to a lot of different people in a lot of different contexts. But I want to talk about one aspect um, that's relevant to operator vectors. So let's think about normal symmetries. Uh, so A is an algebra. The not A is a group. Right? And since odd A is a group, we can talk about group actions on our algebra by looking at homomorphisms from a general group in odd A. Group actions, and you know this is normally what we mean by symmetry, and we uh, go off and, as mathematicians, try to study these and classify these uh, in situations of interest. But also, as many of you know, there's a map or a correspondence that takes an automorphism and produces a bimorphism. Okay, so how does this work? You can take an automorphism and define a bimodule. Alpha, which is just as a vector space A, and maybe if you're doing von Neumann algebras, you might take L2A here. Just to my With the, the left and right actions twisted, or at least the left action is twisted. So, how is that going to work? Define it to be alpha inverse of A times B C. So, you twist the left action by alpha. Okay? Um, and what you see is that if I take these correspondences and look at the or by modules and I take the relative tensor product, this is isomorphic to A alpha composed here. And that's why the inverse is there to make this the composition. Okay? And so this by module operation remembers the composition. Okay, not so this isn't really an inclusion because when are two of these isomorphic? Well, A alpha is going to be isomorphic to A alpha prime. If and only if alpha and alpha prime differ by an inner armonics. So, uh, in some sense, you know, this, if, if I just look at isomorphism classes of these bimodules, I've forgotten some information. But actually, if you remember the whole structure of a category here, like remember the morphisms between them, you don't actually forget this information. In some sense. So, um, yeah, but the whole point of this is okay, well, what kind of algebraic structure is this thing? Because if I figure out what kind of algebraic structure this thing is, then I can have generalized symmetries by looking at abstract versions of that algebraic structure and homomorphisms into this thing. And that will generalize uh, the ordinary notion of group action. Okay? So, oh, I think I should write small. I'm going kind of quick. I have my board that uses. <laughs> it's going to be a lot of white paint. <laughs> All right, let's see if I can write small there. Uh, okay. Who made his attention? Is that your reference to Ranty's ruler? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? It's in C and I Yeah, that's right. The answer is no. <laughs> that's just writing closer together. That's just writing closer together. That helps it space. I don't know. It makes it harder to read. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, 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 so this is the kind of algebraic object that, that Binet is. And so what's going on uh, with Binet? You know, what makes this a tensor category? Well, first of all, it's a linear category. So you know, I have objects, the bimodules, I have morphisms, the bimodule intertwiners. The morphisms form vector spaces, right? Complex vector spaces, you can have them. Uh, and you know, if this is a, a C star or W star algebra, which of course we'll ultimately be interested in, then this also is what you might call C star or W star category, the morphism have adjoints, these sort of things. Um, but the thing that really makes it tensor is that you have this tensor product operation. So you have this relative tensor product. So I can take two objects and tensor them together. I can take two morphisms and tensor them together. Um, and it's, uh, I'll put this in parentheses. Uh, 
me not print Z quotation marks because I'm not going to actually define what this means, but try to just give you an idea. So it's coherently associated. So I have uh, distinguished isomorphisms that let me move my parentheses around. And when you define a tensor category, it's not enough to just have some isomorphisms that do this. They have to be coherent. So basically, if I made a big tensor, like parenthesized thing, and I used these isomorphisms to get from one parenthesization to another, I better get the same answer when I do it in different ways. That's what these coherences guarantee for you. And if you want a formal definition, you know, Google the, the Pentagon equation, you'll see why I didn't write it down uh, during this talk, especially with the way that I'm writing, it would take up like two whole boards <laughs> to try to write it down. Uh, so yeah, but uh, right. Coherently associative, uh, so, right, so I have this associative tensor product, and there's a special, you know, A, if I think of it as an A bimodule, and again, if you're doing von Neumann algebras, you might do L2A here, but uh, this is a tensor unit, which means that uh, I have special distinguished isomorphisms uh, so that tensor unit A doesn't really do anything. And these have to satisfy some conditions with these called the triangle axiom. But uh, again, I won't write that down. It's a similar principle about where they come from. Okay, so tensor categories. That, that bin A is a tensor category. So it makes sense then to talk about actions of tensor categories on algebras by looking at tensor functors, which are basically you know, functors between these categories that have coherences between these tensor products. Kind of just the natural thing you would do if you were trying to say what is a homomorphism between tensor categories. Um, you would end up with that. Okay, so the kinds of, so okay, good, so we want to study actions of tensor categories on algebras. What's the nicest kind of tensor category that you can start with? What's the smallest, nicest, simplest thing you could come up with? And the answer is a fusion category. So fusion categories uh, are nice, nicest, finite tensor cats. Um, and the canonical example to keep in mind your whole time, this whole time is rep G, where G is finite. In some sense, this is the, the, the motivating example. These are generalizations of the niceness of these things. So, what properties do fusion categories have? Well, they're uh, finitely semi simple uh, tensor cats. So what does finitely semi simple mean? Well, think about in rep G. So in rep G, you have these really nice building blocks. Um, and I guess when I say rep G, I mean over an algebraically closed field. Of course, I mean the complex numbers uh, in all these situations. But you have these building blocks, irreducible representations, and every representation is isomorphic to a direct sum of these things. And there's only finitely many of them up to isomorphism. So that's what finitely semi simple means. It means every object is isomorphic to a direct sum of irreducible objects. Or irreducible just means your endomorphisms are the scalars, the Homs in your category to itself. And there's only finitely many isomorphism classes of size vectors. So that's what rules out like rep G for a G compact group. That's almost a fusion category, but there's infinitely many isomorphism classes of objects. So finite gives us this finite this in the semi-simple, semi-simple thing. And uh, the unit object should also be simple. So in rep G, that's the trivial representation, right? That's a simple, because it's one-dimensional, that's always a simple object. And then finally, you need this condition which looks a bit mysterious when you just kind of write it down on the board. And uh, you need the category to be rigid, which means every object has duals. So there's a precise categorical you know, definition of what it means to have duals. The examples in Rev G are the dual representation, contragradian representation on the dual vector space. But one way to think about what this gives you, so this isn't a definition, but this is a consequence of having duals, is you get Frobenius reciprocity. So uh, every object X has another object, X star, so there's some dual object, and I can do Frobenius reciprocity. So like hom from X tensor Y the z is isomorphic to hom uh, from y to x dual tensor z. So 
you know, this isn't the definition of, of, of duals, but it's a consequence and you can think of that, you know, it's the kind of thing that you're getting, it's like an, a junction to your, to the tensor product. Tensoring with x, there's some other object tensoring with uh, x dual, which is an adjunction to that. Okay, so let's talk about some examples of fusion categories. These are the nicest kind of finite things that I'm already at the erase value. It would be nice if there was like a little uh, music you could turn on to play <laughs> while I was doing this, you know, a little elevator music. I'm sure there uh, are people who can do it. <laughs> 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 I think it would come uh, every, minors, everyone's minors. <laughs> but so, does anyone have any questions while I do this? This might be a good time for questions. You're going to get good at putting this ball. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's very Back board up, sorry, What's that, Sam? You move the board back up so I can move this. Ah, yes, good. Right. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, that's hard. <laughs> Thanks. Good. All right. Uh, right, so fusion categories. So, what are some examples? So, See, I looked a little fun. So as I said about G, well G is finite. Okay, uh, and actually, okay, so if you like quantum groups, you could put a finite quantum group here, which just means a compact quantum group, uh, which is actually finite dimensional, it's a Z-star algebra. Um, but you could also do, so actually, this is a special case of that, sorry, but you could put Hill G. This is the category of G-graded Hilbert spaces. And in our quantum symmetries paradigm, this is an essential example to think about because the ordinary case of group actions can be seen as you know, actions of this fusion category. So when you're trying to generalize stuff in group actions, you do it through this example uh, using this as, as the fusion category. So I want to say a bit more words about this, you know, how this actually works. So objects are finite dimensional, I should say, G-graded Hilbert spaces. Okay, so Hilbert spaces with the G-graded. Morphisms are just morphisms between the Hilbert spaces that preserve the grading. And then the tensor product, so if I look at a homogeneously graded vector space, so something that just has a G component and zeros everywhere else, and I tensor it with something that's graded with H, well, that's going to be G tensor W, but now it's graded by G. So the tensor product just shifts, it uses the, the gradient to multiply the, the components. And the dual, uh, so if I had a homogeneous object and I said, what's, what's the dual of this thing? It would be, take the dual vector space, but now graded by the input component. Okay. And, uh, yeah, and so that's a really nice example. The simple objects here correspond to group elements, right? The one-dimensional vector spaces up to isomorphism. One-dimensional vector spaces graded in the G component, and the tensor product just implements group multiplication. So, in some sense, if you want to think, you can think of a fusion category generalizing about G, but you can also think of it as generalizing G itself. It kind of categorifies and generalizes G at the same time. Um, and there's a little game you can play, and you'll see a bit more about this in, in Sam's talk, is that if uh, omega is a 3 cycle um, in your group, then you can twist the associator. So in the definition of tensor category, we have those coherent associated isomorphisms. Well, what you can do is, when I'm doing VG tensor W, H tensor you know, UK or something like this, my ordinary isomorphism just kind of used the vector space uh, isomorphism. But what I could do now is I could twist this ordinary one by multiplying by this 3 code cycle evaluated at GHK. And you can check that the, the, the axioms that you need for this to be coherently associated are exactly satisfied when this, if you picked any scalar function here, they would be exactly satisfied if it satisfies the three cycle condition. Okay, so, so that's another way to, to get categories that aren't just you know, purely group theoretical, it's not just right or Hill G, you can twist it a little bit, and these are quite different as categories than these categories here.
Okay. So yes. is it on purpose that you are not having a star operation on morphisms, or are you no. just not putting all conditions? I'm just not putting all conditions. Yeah, yeah. So with the savant exactly right. Really, what we care about are unitary fusion categories, and these are things that satisfy everything that I say, except they're also C star categories, which means that the home spaces have entrance. So that's why you know when I say rep G, I want unitary representations of G, and then I can take adjoints of morphisms. I'm just ignoring that. Uh, no, I'm going to try and fail to ignore it. Try and fail to ignore it. Yes, very good. Very good. Okay, and uh, so okay, so now there's also a bunch of examples uh, from uh, quantum groups at roots of unity. So these are, of course, not the usual compact quantum groups that we might be used to here. But these are, you know, if you take U Q of G and you evaluate at a root of unity, and you take the tilting modules, and you do the semi-simplification procedure, you actually end up with interesting fusion categories where the objects look like the representations of the class fully algebra, but they're truncated at some level, and the fusion rules are modified, and all this sort of stuff. Um, these are also appear in conformal field theory. Uh, uh, so, so these are important ones in conformal field theory. And there's many more families that you know, people who study fusion categories like to go and classify. You know, there's, we saw in Pinhas' talk, the Hogwarts Zumi categories, then there's near group categories, and there's exotic ones constructed by hand. So, you know, people, there's a huge program to try to classify these things, uh, and people go off and try to find them. And there's lots more than just this list I wrote on the board, but, you know, they're kind of hard to, 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 to write down explicitly. So those are examples. And then there's one more family of examples that, <laughs> that I should mention. Which come from subfactors. Okay. I may, but you know, in the interest of time, I'm just going to not. I'm going to do a subpar. What's simple? That would happen too, but. Okay, any questions so far? That looks decent. Usable. Okay, gotcha. Okay. So now let's let n inside n be an inclusion of two one factors. So If you want finite index, but actually let me say it implied, implies finite index anyway. Then what I can do is I can take L2 of n and think of it as an nn by module. Right? And I take the tensor category generated by this, so I take all tensor powers, I take some ends, and I uh, and, and I just generate the tensor category inside bin uh, n. And so this isn't always a fusion category, but when it is, this subfactor is called finite depth. So if you ever heard someone say finite depth subfactor, what it means is actually this tensor category of bimodules generated by two L two n is a fusion category. So that wasn't the original definition, but that's how I think of it nowadays. Okay, so that was the last example, and that's why historically a lot of interesting results about fusion categories have come from the subfactor community because people studying subfactors naturally started looking at fusion categories because a lot of their examples started. So you know, one of the streams that led to the definition of fusion categories was definitely subfactor theory and it's through this connection. Okay, so those are all the examples that I want to say. Is there a clock? Yeah. So here's a problem. Kind of an obvious problem. Classify actions of fusion cats on algebras. And of course, you can say you know, purely algebraic, but or C star or von Neumann algebras, which of course is interesting. So ultimately, I'm going to be interested in, in doing this for C star algebras, but I want to start with some motivating results from the case of uh, two one factors. And so this is maybe one of the uh, fundamental theorems in subfactor theory, 
And of course, the actual theorem is more general than what I'm going to write down here. I'm just writing the fusion category version. It's, it's, it's actually much more general. And this is Popus theorem. And it says every fusion category has uh, a unique uh, outer action uh, on the hyperfinite two one factor. Okay, uh, I brush something under the rug. What do I mean by unique? Uh, classify action of fusion categories on algebras up to equivalence relation. So there's a natural equivalence relation on actions that generalizes co-cycle quantities. So if you're if you're used to thinking about group actions, then uh, then then uh, say co-cycle quantities here. Okay. So there's there's a natural equivalence relation on actions generalizing co-cycle conjugacy, and that's what I mean when I say. Okay. So obviously uh, Popa didn't say it this way, and when he originally proved this theorem, uh, this is kind of a modern reinterpretation of it uh, in terms of this action of fusion categories framework. Okay, and outer just means that the functor is what's called fully faithful, the, the functor from the fusion category to binomials, and it generalizes in the action case being. Uh, so correct. Yes. I mean, because this links to what Sergey was studying. I mean, his true theorem is that every amenable. Yes. Uh, that's right. Category yeah. Is, uh, yeah, that's right. The true theorem is is about amenable is fusion cat. You can replace fusion category with amenable tensor category. And um, yeah, and, and, and yeah, that's absolutely great. Okay, and this is but certainly not the only result that we know about fusion categories and their actions on von Neumann algebras. So I'll say a couple that I won't write down, but it's also known, you know, Popolis Chetenko showed that every fusion category, and in fact, every unitary tensor category, admits an action on LF infinity. Um, and you can also use you know, some other interpolated free group factors. Uh, that's a GGS construction, shows that you can get other things in there as well for fusion categories. Um, Stefan proved that there exist two factors whose category of bifinite bimodules is totally trivial. So that's a very strong kind of classification result for that. And uh, extending that work, uh, Rom and uh, Falguer and Rom showed that every for every fusion category, there exists a 2-1 factor whose category of bifinite bimodules is that fusion category. So that's also a very strong classification result. I can tell you all the actions on that, just purely algebraic. So there, there are some really strong results uh, in, of that form. But you know, um, in terms of the, 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 the classification, in terms of two one factors that were already lying around, you know, the, the, this is in some sense the only thing that we know. Um, so if you're interested in trying to push some sub-factor ideas and these kind of things into the seesaw realm, you might start by, by looking at this and saying, OK, this was kind of our fundamental theorem in sub-factors. Can we try to start doing stuff in the CSAR world that's analog of, of this? And the first thing you, you, you learn from CSAR algebras is there, what, what's the CSAR analog? There's many different ones, depending on how you think of the hyperfinite to one factor, right? Because there's a lot of equivalent characterizations, Kant's fundamental theorem. So, you know, if you think of this as an amenable type object, you might end up with a notion like nuclearity. But if you take hyperfiniteness, the original Murray von Neumann definition, really seriously, you end up with a nice class of algebras called AF algebras. So, AF algebras uh, are C star, again, not the only C star analog, but a C star analog of uh, really hyperfinite. Okay, what does it mean to be AF? Uh, it means, you know, C star algebra is AF if there's uh, an increasing union of finite dimensional subalgebras, which is dormant dense. Okay, and that's analog here because hyperfinite, one definition is, is an increasing union of finite dimensional subalgebras that's weakly dense, right, or strongly dense or whatever. And here you use norm density, so that's the difference. Okay, and so, uh, so this is a nice place to start. So the question, can we classify fusion category actions? Maybe, you know, if you're being naive, maybe you could hope for some kind of analog, some kind of uniqueness statement about actions of fusion categories. Um, but you quickly realize, you know, that things like that are never going to work because there's a profusion of AF algebras. Uh, so, right, so, 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 so how are these even classified in the first place? And that's Elliott's theorem. Uh, so this is Elliott's theorem. Let's see, it's two L's and two T's, right? Yes, good. Um, 
AF algebras are classified by their order k theories or partial. So what do I mean by their order k zero? So by and I should have said this in the beginning, all my algebras are unital. When you're doing C star algebras, it's important to consider non-unital things. But everything I'm saying is unital because I originally started doing subfactors and it's hard for me to think about non-unital things correctly. Uh, so, so everything's unital here. AF algebras are classified by uh, the triple. So I have K0 of A, right? Murray von Neumann, if you will, equivalence classes of projections in A tensor M infinity. And then you remember the, the image um, of the, the projections. I mean, this is actually the Murray von Neumann, the image of the Murray von Neumann equivalence class. This is the growth and decompletion that makes it a group. So together, it turns out for AF algebras, this become since they're stably finite, this is a, gives it a partially ordered structure on the abelian group. And there's one more piece of information, which is to remember the algebra up to isomorphism, and not just Murray equivalence, you need to remember the special element in here that corresponds to the unit. Okay? And so if I have an isomorphism of these structures, that gives that there, there exists an isomorphism of algebras, and in fact, you can even say that that isomorphism is unique up to approximate unitary equivalence. So there's even a bit stronger, but here I'm just using the fact that they are isomorphic. Okay, so the idea then is okay, I'm not probably not gonna get any kind of uniqueness of fusion category actions. That wouldn't even really make very much sense. But maybe I can come up with some kind of k-theoretic invariant that gives me a classification of actions on AF algebras in terms of some analog of this k theoretic type invariant. So that's kind of the, 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 the question that, that, that we started thinking about is can we, can we do that? And the answer is uh, no, we don't know how to do that. But there's a certain natural class of actions that we can do it for. And these are what I call AF actions. So I'll just say it briefly before I write it down. But you can talk about actions of fusion categories on finite dimensional algebras and take inductive limits of those. Those can be actions on an AF algebra, but they're a special type. They, they came from finite, from inductive limits of finite dimensional ones. And somehow, the reason we ended up there is because when you look at the proof of, of this theorem, Elliott's intertwining argument, and you break down the structure, you see that what you really need in order to prove a theorem like this is a, is a, AF object in the category of things that have C actions. Like, you, you need to be an inductive limit of finite dimensional actions to really uh, pull the proof through, in, at least in a naive way. So that's why uh, we restricted to that. But so let me write that down, the definition of the And then I'll try to tell you uh, what, what the invariant is. Okay. Excuse me. Yes. What would be the status of classifying actions of finite groups on AF algebra, because that should be the first thing that... Yeah, so good. So, yeah, and I'll, I'll write that, that, that down a little bit more when I uh, write down the statement of the theorems, but nobody knows how to classify finite group actions on AF algebra, so that would have, you know, that's a giveaway that our program was probably hopeless. In the inductive limit of finite group action case, only partial results are known before. So this actually gives a new result for group actions, uh, for finite group actions, that are inductive limits of finite dimensional action. So there were some partial results. I'll write down uh, all the names for those partial results, but this is the first complete classification of them. So, you know, in some sense, you might say that it shows that category thinking can be useful even if you're just studying group actions. But yeah, that's a really good point already for just group actions on AF algebras. We have no idea. Okay. So that's why you should have to unhide in your back. Yeah, can you unhide the board? Yes. Oh, okay. yes. <laughs> okay. I'm worried that I'm not going to be able to reach it when I push it up too high. Okay. So, uh, uh, an AF action on A. What does that mean? Well, so I have some AF approximation. I have, for each one of these I's, I have an action FI on A. I'm just kind of implicitly using this notation. And uh, C acting on A uh, is going to be isomorphic to the, in the limit. There's a natural notion of inductive limit of these actions. 
Okay? So that's what we mean by an inductive limit action. It's just like in acting these finite building blocks, there's a natural notion of limit, and, that, and that's what we have with these things up there. But just to be clear, I mean, you mean the third, yeah, because I could choose two different inductive limits giving the same. Uh, yeah, I don't care about It's not a general structure, just the existence of such a thing is what we're looking for. Uh, yeah, you could have, and indeed, you can just like, yeah, you can have two totally different towers that look different at each stage and look totally different, but they give you nice and more And we have examples of that. Okay, good. So, so, so that's what we mean by attractions. And so the theorem that I'm eventually going to write down, uh, hopefully I'll get there, let's see, I'm going to the 20 yet, uh, is that we can completely classify these in terms of a k-theoretic invariant. But in order to do that, I need to define this invariant for you. Okay, so that's the next step to define this invariant. And it needs a bit more category. So. These are, uh, I'm lying a little bit, but that's okay. I think if you do category theory, you're allowed to lie a little bit a lot. I don't know, someone told me that once. So. <laughs> Q systems are finite dimensional C star algebra objects uh, internal to a fusion category C. So what do I mean by that? Well, how do you define an associative algebra, right? It's a vector space and a map from V tensor V to V that satisfies some big diagram, right? Well, all of those components make sense in any tensor category. I can take an object in my fusion category and a map from X tensor X to X that satisfies the same conditions, and I can get down the definition of an associative algebra. And so if you work a little hard, you, you, harder, like you can give an equivalent characterization of finite dimensional C star algebra objects, uh, internal to a category and describe them using Q systems. Now, te more technically, what Q systems are are unitary Frobenius algebra objects. So there's some non-trivial wrangling to get from here to here in the usual situation, but um, yeah, you should think of them as finite dimensional C star algebra objects inside the fusion category C. Okay, so in order to elucidate what's going on, let me explain in this Hill G case what the, what the Q systems are. Okay, so uh, in Hill G, so I'm only going to tell you, I'm going to overcount the Q systems because we only care about these things uh, up to what's called the equivalence, but I'm going to write down a, a parameterizing list anyway. Uh, the, the connected Q systems are given by pairs. H, mu, where uh, H is a subgroup of G, and mu uh, is a two-cocycle uh, on H. With coefficients in, so you one again. I just mean the, the unitary group of one. I just mean the complex scalars and modules. Uh, I did that before. So these, so so it's the data you know that you need to, to build like the twisted group algebra for for, for for a subgroup. Okay, and there's an equivalence relation on these that we care about them too, which will correspond to Morita equivalence, you know, internal to the category C, where you might say H mu is equivalent to K omega if there exists a G, so that these are conjugate to each other, uh, with HG equal to K, and the cohomology class of mu G equal to omega, the cohomology class of okay. So th this is the natural equivalence relation that we're going to care about these things up to. This is isomorphism uh, in the property category. Now, Q systems actually form pieces of what, what's called a, a two category. So in, in, in order to avoid having to worry about what a two category is, I'm going to decategorify it and say Q systems form a one category, where the objects are Q systems, and then morphisms are going to be isomorphism classes of bimodules between the Q systems, internal to C. So uh, between uh, H mu and uh, K omega, there's, there's bimodule objects, which are, of course, if, if Q systems are like finite dimensional algebras, these are just like Hilbert space bimodules between them, but they're internal to C. So what do they correspond to in, the, in, this, in this group case? Well, they're actually, so just G-graded bimodules of the twisted group algebras that, such that the grading is compatible with the, 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 the grading here. Okay, so, so G-graded uh, C mu H, I think that's the notation that I see a lot, C uh, omega K, so I take the twisted group algebras, these are just finite dimensional C star algebras. I have a bimodule for these. 
has to be G graded, so it has a decomposition in G, and I need it to be compatible with the H and K graded. So when I multiply by the, the, the H basis element, it better shift the gradient by, by multiplication by H on the left. Multiply by K on the left. And I take these up to isomorphism, okay? And then there's a relative tensor product, just the ordinary relative tensor product you can show preserves this G graded structure, and I can build a category. So my category, the objects are these things. The morphisms are isomorphism classes of these bimodules. And the composition is relative tensor product, which is taken up the isomorphism. And in general, that whole thing makes sense in all of C. You just have Q systems uh, inside C, uh, and you have bimodules inside C, and you define that category. But in this co concrete case of an actual group in Hill G, it becomes something very concrete. That's not so unfamiliar. OK, any questions? So the next piece to define the invariant is that whenever you have an action of a fusion category, you can realize all of these Q systems as big extensions of your algebra. So this is generalizing the cross product construction. Okay, and you can realize all these bimodules as bimodules between these cross products. And what you can do to get an invariant is take a K theory of all those cross products. Those bimodules give you morphisms between the K theory, and you can use that as your invariant. And that's the invariant that we actually use to classify this. So, so I'll write that down, of course, but... Yeah, I time for the last 10 minutes. Is that right? Okay. 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 Does that sound twisted version of the orbit category? Um... It is, uh, depending on precisely what you mean by that, I believe the answer is yes. Given a Q system and given an action on an algebra, so this could be a C star or a von Neumann algebra. It works in both settings. Um, you can define what we call the realization. Um, uh, the, the notation is kind of you know regretful. If we were doing it again, we'd probably call it a generalized cross product because it's literally just generalizing the cross product in the case of an ordinary group action. But this notation comes from algebraic topology. And this is a, a, a C star algebra or von Neumann algebra. I guess we're in C star world, so it's a C star algebra that, that extends it. It's an extension. Okay. And um, right. And uh, so, so every Q system gives you one of these. And for every bimodule, so every for between every QP bimod, X, you can realize it. So apply the realization to get a uh, um, realization of Q. Realization of P by model. So, and the, the products work. So the, the, the point is that this realization is actually functor from this category of Q systems to the category of C star algebras and isomorphism classes of correspondence. And really it's a two functor, but I'm already talking about two functors, so I'll say the two categories. Okay, so Q systems go to C star algebras and uh, bimodules between Q systems go to actual bimodules between the C star algebras. Okay, and the theorem is that it's a functor. So this is actually joint work with uh, the us three authors, but also Dave. So this is earlier work with Dave. So I should mention with uh, Chen, uh, R.H. Uh, Almaraz. Uh, I botched the order. H, no, I did J and Pen. So we proved that this works in the C star and the W star setting that you actually get a functor. Okay, so yes. When you say action, so you need to specify what kind of A by models you wish to consider. Yes. Yeah, that, that's absolutely right. So for C star algebras, what we take are, so the starting point is right finite correspondences. So we take things that are right Hilbert modules over A with the left action of A by jointable operators. You can prove, even if I just took that, even if I didn't ask for it to be right finite, 
that if it's a fusion category action, because of the dualizability that passes forward, it's automatically right finite. And you can also put a left correspondence structure on it for which it's finally generated projected. So there's this theorem that dualizability, you could think of it either way. The way we start, though, just to keep it general, is we start with the category of, of correspondences, which are right correspondences. And because we're doing fusion categories, all this extra stuff comes for free. But you're absolutely right, we do need to specify that, and we're using C-star correspondence. And then the, the fact that it's AF, you will explain later? Yeah, well, so, 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 so this is just an invariant in general. This didn't use AF. So this is just, if I generally have an action, I can always do this. So now let me explain what the invariance is, though. So basically, the invariant is the following. So we call it F hat. So it's going to assign, and you actually only have to take Q systems up to isomorphism in a category. So you can pick one representative for each isomorphism class at the beginning of time. Uh, and just, you just apply this on those, but what we do is we take K0, we take the, the, the original Elliott invariant, the, the order K0 of these things, uh, sorry, of the realization. Realization of Q, F, and then we take, so we only take one sub-realization of Q, F, we only add this one in for the trivial Q system. So you only need to remember the order unit on the trivial Q system. The other ones, you actually don't care about this order unit. You just need the order of the link groups. And that's reflected that we're only caring about these upturn reader equivalents anyway. Okay. So for each Q system, give me this order of the link group or for each isomorphism class. There's only finitely many of them for any fusion category. So for each one, I take this. And then uh, for each, so, it needs, so for each uh, QP binod, Then um, I can define f hat of uh, x to be tensor over uh, the realization, let's see if I can get this right, qf with the realization of x. Okay, so this gives me a, a qp by module, as we said before in realization. Tensoring with it maps finally generated projective realization of Q modules to finally generate projective realization of F modules, so it gives me a map on K theory, an ordered map on K theory. So this goes from F hat of Q to F hat of Q. Okay. So what is the invariant? It's a bunch of uh, partially ordered abelian groups, well they'll only be partially ordered in the stably finite case, but it's a bunch of partially ordered abelian groups and a bunch of maps between them that come from that in my category. And I kind of exp uh, you can really explicitly write this realization thing down in this case, right? It's just a cross product when it's a group action. And there's just an obvious way to realize these graded bimodules as actual bimodules. So it's very concrete in the group action case. And it's also concrete in the category case. You just have to believe categories are concrete. And that, fine. <laughs> uh, that requires some training. That requires some training. That's absolutely right. Okay, so that's the invariant. And now I can say that the yeah. Switch the board first. Switch the board first, okay, thank you. <laughs> I learned slowly. So theorem, yeah, you need to, and this is maybe why maybe people doing group actions didn't really think about this because why would you take all these twisted cross parts of subgroups? Like, uh, so theorem, uh, if uh, C acting on F 
and uh, C acting on B, our AF actions uh, then uh, these are equivalent. Uh, these actions are equivalent. I'll say that one. If and only if the invariants are isomorphic. So I should probably say what it means for invariants to be isomorphic. Uh, but what this f hat is is actually a functor from QSIS, which is a category, to pre ordered abelian groups. So what I mean by isomorphism is natural isomorphism of functors. Yeah, right. Should your second action be a G? Yeah. Yep, thank you. G. So if and only if these, the, the, these functors are, are, are natural okay. So that's the statement of the theorem. And it suggests that this invariant we wrote down is actually a very good invariant, of, a good analog of Eliot's original just K0 order group invariant in the case at least of AF actions. And I can give you a brief sketch of the proof. Uh, it's, 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 you know, it's actually a very simple idea. Uh, you uh, use your nato lemma, which is a you know, famous category result, to show that these f hats give complete classifications for finite dimensional actions, like in terms of existence and uniqueness of morphisms. And this follows from your nato lemma, actually, it follows from what's called unitary Oster theorem, uh, a unitary version of Oster theorem. Uh, and then your nato lemma to uh, complete, completely classify. Uh, finite dimensional things, and then you just use Elliot's intertwining. Uh, then Elliot. Elliot's intertwining argument is, is actually very general. It's a general sort of thing that already in C star world has been used in many different ways in many different times as a framework. You can kind of apply it. Uh, but that's the sketch of the proof. Now, the, page, the paper is like 50 something pages, so. This is really an abbreviated summary of the technicalities that go in here, but the idea is quite simple. Okay, and in the last, uh, let's see, five, yeah. uh, the last two minutes, let me give you an application. So there's a bunch of applications of this form, but uh, follow me. So I can take this twisted hill, the Z mod PZ, omega, with omega, not trivial. Okay, uh, so a non-trivial co-cycle. This has a unique AF action uh, on um, the UHF algebra M uh, P infinity. So the infinite tensor product of P by P matrices. Uh, you can use this. Theorem to, to show that, that there's a unique AF action on this C algebra. And, and, and what if you would take the trivial cycle? It goes wrong. Or? Yeah, it goes wrong. The invariant, because the invariant becomes much more, or not much more complicated, but there's at least more than one action. Yeah. Um, because what goes wrong when you have a non trivial co cycle, how many Q systems do you have? There's only one trivial Q system. There's no, because in this case, Q systems are subgroups with trivializations of the. Of the Three co cycle and ZP has only the trivial subgroup for which omega restricts trivially. So the invariance just becomes the K theory of the C star algebra and the action of this thing on that K theory. So P is not a prime, or P is a prime, sorry. But then there are not so many subgroups of ZPZ. Exactly, so there's two. But that, uh, uh, there's a trivial and the whole one. Here I'm only allowed to use the trivial one because omega doesn't trivialize on the whole subgroup. Yeah, yeah, so it's a subtle difference. So Z mod P Z still has two things I need to look at. Z P Z omega only has one, the trivial one. And so the, the invariant becomes much simpler. Okay, uh, so let me give you another one really quickly. So I can take diffusion category fib, which has two objects, you know, one in tau, and satisfies tau squared equals one plus tau. Okay, this has a, uh, a unique AF action on um, the, the AFC star algebra whose, um, uh, whose K theory is given by the Z plus Z adjoin the golden ratio. Right, so there's kind of a, this is one of the canonical examples of an AF algebra. Its Bratzig diagram looks like 
uh, or a Bradley diagram for it looks something like this. Um, dot dot dot. Uh, there's a unique A. And again, you can use the fact that there's only the trivial Q system, so the invariant becomes much simpler. But we also do a bunch of computations in other examples with not like Z mod 4Z and stuff, uh, where you, you really can compute the whole invariant. It's just a big thing to write down. So I'm not I'm out of time. So thank you.